Chapter 8 Flesh vs. Spirit Wanyanyekova felt an intense joy inside, looking up toward heaven. Truly, Jeremiah, this feels like fire shut up in my bones. Letsi appeared before Wanyanyekovu. In the morning, make your way to Sondheimer, for this will be your last stop before you arrive in Tallulah, he said. It is so. By nightfall, Wanyanyekovu had finally laid down, but his mind was still racing. Once asleep, he saw himself in the clouds again. As he descended toward earth, he saw a huge gathering, and in the center, there appeared an elderly man marching in front of a military-style formation. He heard someone shout out a command, and the formation marched in place, while the elderly man broke formation and marched up a few steps and stood in front of a podium. There were eleven men and women, and behind each of them, there were twenty people. Behind the twenty, there were two hundred, and behind the two hundred, there were thousands. All marching in a unified formation. Another command was shouted, and he heard a great crowd. Cheering as the man stopped and three women broke away from the formation and walked onto the stage. The elderly man looked at the people behind him on stage, as he stood in front of a group of thousands of young men and women. A tear rolled from his eyes, the crowd shouting, Sabaoth is mighty! The crowd stood up and cheered again. Please, please, sit down, for we are all mighty warriors of Sabaoth. We're here today because Sabaoth has called us together to do his work. We are many clans, but today we are finally one people with one heart and on one accord. He paused. Let us follow our hearts this day. Rejoice for Sabaoth has brought us out of the darkness we once were in. Yes, and united us to fight for freedom, not freedom of this world but the one to come and that with great power. The crowd roared. Never did we know that something was hidden in us all these centuries, in our DNA, not seen, but felt within us. It can't be touched but with it, we can move mountains. He then took out his hand and reached toward the sky, turning his hand into a fire. One Yekavu woke up, and Yael was standing over him with the same blank face as usual, and one Yekavu said to him, I keep having these. Dreams, what do they mean? Yael looked at him. I'm here to train you and protect you. Now. Go, make your way to Sondheimer. Beware that there will be obstacles and battles along your way. Wanyan Yekavu reached for his backpack and began gathering his things. When he turned to speak to Yael, he had already disappeared. Wanyan Yekavu said to himself, I should have expected that from Yael. As he finished gathering his belongings, he headed south on Highway 65. As he approached Sandfield Road, a strange sound could be heard coming out of the bushes, but he could not recognize the sound, so he grabbed his cane and strolled with caution. The noise had stopped. Passing Sandfield Road, the noise returned with a buzzing sound following it. Wanyanyekovu stopped and held his stance, but nothing was visible. With his eyes slowly moving around, trying to pinpoint the noise, it stopped again as soon as he reached Outpost Jin Road. The noise got louder. Out of the bushes walked five men dressed in battle gear from head to toe. One man, six foot two inches tall, very muscular, and weighed roughly three hundred pounds, appeared to be the group leader and stood along the edge of the woods. He signaled to the other men with his hand gesture, and the rest quickly ran out and surrounded Wanyan Yekavu. Little man, you're too far from home to be out here alone, said the man as he walked out to the middle of the road. They were Anakata's men with blades and guns, and one had a sword with a rotating blade, which made the buzzing sound. Looking at Wanyan Yekavu from head to toe, the leader said to his men, Whose child is this? And why would he be out here all alone? Wanyan Yekavu stood there in a stance, carefully looking at them all, even those that stood in his peripheral. I am not a child and definitely not alone, for Sabaoth is with me everywhere I go. Wanyan Yekava said in anger after being referred to as a child. The man laughed. Here we have one of those stupid-ass Nazarites. The rest of the men laughed and mocked Wanyan Yekavu as the anger in Wanyan Yekavu quickly became enraged while the men stood there and mocked him. A tall man approached. No need to get angry, little man. We come in peace. Just hand us your weapons and that bag you have, and we will be on our way. That is all we want. 
One Yunyek of saw Yael appear and thought it was a test. Yael, what is this? One Yunyek said. Yael said nothing before sitting on the ground with his legs folded. Not able to see Yael, the man said. Who is it in which you speak to? Is your God here with us? Tell him to show himself so we may make a wish. The men mocked and laughed again at Wanyanyekavu. The stranger said as he pointed to his men, My men wish to make one wish to your God, and if he grants us our wishes, we will leave in peace. However, we will take your weapons and your life if he does not. This is Tavi. Go ahead, Tavi. Tell his God what your wish is. Wanyanyekavu began to get tired of the blasphemy. He judged the men's distance and prepared himself for battle as the stranger continued to talk. This is Zader, Ude, Baal, and I am Achilles. If your god is not suitable for you, maybe you can worship me. As soon as Wanyanyekova heard the man say, You can worship me. Wanyanyekova threw a star with great force into the center of the man's skull, killing him instantly. Baal and Zader attacked Wanyanyekova while Ude and Tavi ran back to their camp. Yael just sat there as Baal grabbed Achilles' blade and charged at Wanyanyekavu. Wanyanyekavu quickly grabbed his cane and blocked the sword, and he heard Zader approach from behind him. He mule kicked Zader in the groin and simultaneously twisted the handle of his cane, forcing the blade to release from the chamber, spun around, and severed Xander's head from his body. Taking two steps back, Wanyanyekavu stuck the cane's blade into Bale's stomach and worked the edge up to his neck until his intestines oozed out of his body, killing him. Wanyanyekavu forcefully swung the cane as the blood from the two men fell to the ground. Seeing the blood, Wanyanyekavu was unsure if these were indeed men or spiritual beings, and his heart sank for a minute because he had never killed a man before, and his heart felt heavy and saddened. Thinking to himself that since Yao was there, he had made the scene look realistic. Yael stood up. You would not be so tired if you had fought in the spirit. Shaking his head. You did okay, but when you fight out of anger, you tend to lose control. Wanyanyekova bent down with both his hands on his knees, out of breath. I remember an old martial artist named Bruce Lee who said, Learn to discipline your emotions, because if you don't, your enemies will use them against you. Rising. He looked around him and saw all the carnage. Wanyanyekovu was in shock and slowly said, These were real men? The blood had covered the road and began oozing out of the bodies of the three men. Wanyanyekovu, still in shock, vomited. Yael looked at Wanyanyekovu with a straight face. Kill or be killed. There is no more time for tests. See the world for what it is. This world hates you just because you are who you are. Before you find rest in Sondheimer, you will kill more or die. Yell then disappeared. Wanyanyekova walked over to a samurai that he noticed lying on the ground. He flipped it over and noticed it was old and nicely crafted. Looking at the details, it was a Wakatilian sword. Excellent craftsmanship. I'm going to keep it for myself, he said to himself. Since Wanyanyekovu was an excellent hunter who knew about tracking, he said aloud, Those other men probably ran back to their camp. If I stay on the road, they will find me. But if I leave the road, it will not be easy to track me. Wanyanyekovu decided to re-step in their tracks until he found a place to hide until they passed. Twenty minutes later, Uday and Tavi had returned with more men. He could hear a man speaking to Tavi and Uday. How is it a child has defeated my brother? Tavi nervously said, This child just threw some kind of object, and it hit him dead in the middle of his forehead, killing him instantly. Wanyanyekova waited for ten minutes and headed south towards Sonheimer. He found himself in what might have been a sugarcane field, for there was sugarcane growing wild in some spots. He stopped for a minute and rested as he cut off a piece of sugarcane. As he ate it, he heard the men, but he could tell there were not as many as before. They must have split up. He stood on his knees and waited for a while before moving on. There was a road ahead, and Wanyanyekovu got low, stuck his head out of the field, and looked in both directions. Reading an old street sign, he could tell he was on the corner of Par Road 1131 and Parker Road. He waited a while longer, staying low, trying to rush to the other side. 
one in Yekova felt two presents, one of compassion and the other of hostility. Just then, like a flash of light, he saw Mletsi anointing his hands and laying them on him in a vision. You have the gift to search a man's heart. But not only a man, but also all of Sabaoth's creations. You will know if he lies or speaks the truth. Then he returned to the present. Before he got to the other side of the road, Uday and Tavi were shouting, He's here! Wanyan Yekova looked at the two men standing before him with weapons drawn. I'm not here for trouble. I'm just trying to go my way in peace. You guys were the ones that attacked and harassed me. I was just defending myself, Uday said. That might be, but you killed someone's only brother, and he will not allow you to live another day for your actions. Wanyan Yekova shook his head. I understand. I will fight him and only him. If I win, you let me go in peace, and we will leave it at that, Tavi said in anger. If you kill one of us, you have to kill all of us. You fucking Katie. Trying not to get mad as he did before, Wanyanyekovu turned to Tavi. I will permit no man to narrow and degrade my soul by making me hate him. A quote by Booker T. Washington. Tavi turned red with anger. Fuck you and Booker T. motherfucker. Taking a deep breath, Wanyanyekovu, looking at Uday. Booker T. Washington also said, Associate yourself with people of good quality, for it is better to be alone than to be in bad. Company The rest of the men walked out of the woods and Wanyanyekovu tried to reason with the men. I beg of you, I understand one of you wants revenge for your brother's death, and that I understand, but let me just fight that one and if I win, let me go in peace, but if I lose, I will accept my fate. A man walked up and stood in front of Wanyanyekviu, saying to the crowd of men, You mean to tell me this boy, pointing his finger at Wanyanyekviu, killed my brother? I would be a fool to believe such a thing. He then turned to Tavi and Uday. You two are trying to deceive me with foolishness, and for that, I will take your lives. He commanded the men to take the two and force them to kneel in front of Wanyanyekviu. You may go on your way, for these men tried to have you killed. Wanyan Yekova said to the man, I killed the men that harassed and tried to kill me, but I can honestly say it was self-defense. Tavi and Uday sighed. In relief. Achilles was my brother, the leader of these two men. If you did truly kill him, it's their responsibility to kill you first, and if they cannot do it, then I shall. Wanyan Yekova felt the heart of the two men again and knew that Uday was not a killer. He said to the man, Mister, I don't want to fight either of them, but be on my way in peace. The man shouted, In peace. There is no peace, for my brother is dead. As sure as my name is Anatoly, someone will die today for my brother's death. Tavi rose and grabbed Uday, saying, We shall fight for the honor of Achilles and revenge your brother's death. Wanyanyekova then stood in a stance, and in the corner of his eyes, he saw Yael standing there with his sword drawn. Wanyan Yekavu turned to Yael. I shall fight in the spirit and conquer my enemies in the name of Sabaoth. The men were confused, and Tavi said, This boy speaks foolishness like a madman. Wanyan Yekavu looked around and felt every man's heart, and then into Uday's eyes before turning to Anatoly. Let me quote one more foolish thing before you see death. It's by Booker T. Washington as well. A lie doesn't become truth, wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good, just because it's accepted by a majority. Wanyanyekovu bowed, quickly got into a stance, and pointed for Tavi and Uday to advance. He took the butt of his cane and knocked Uday out. Turning slightly, he cut off Tavi's hand. Tavi yelled in pain. Quickly, Wanyanyekovu turned again and severed his head from his body. Before his body hit the ground, Anatoly shouted the men's name to attack. Uva Klaus Hans Otto! The men rushed to Wanyanyekovu while he was placing his cane around his shoulder. As Wanyanyekovu grabbed Otto's arm and turned him around, he bent and broke it. While breaking his arm, Wanyanyekovu grabbed Otto by the neck and, using his body weight, spun around and broke Otto's neck. As one in Yekovu's feet hit the ground, he mule-kicked Klaus. Klaus bent over in pain. 
Wanyan Yekova rolled over Klaus's back and punched Uva in the throat with so much force that he stood there gasping for air. Hans tried to pull out a sword, but Wanyan Yekova grabbed it before he could and killed him and Klaus with the man's own sword. As Uva stood still holding his throat, Wanyan Yekova took Hans's sword and plunged it into Yui's heart. Once again, Wanyan Yekova reached for his cane and fought the men quickly, gracefully, and with power. As Anatoly became furious, he shouted, Gabriel, Alexander, a fantasy, Arif. The men approached. Wanyan Yekova killed the men almost as quickly as Anatoly called their names out. Outraged at how Wanyan Yekova killed his men, Anatoly called the rest of the men. Bovin, Chirag, Darshit, Devans, Veshan. Wanyan Yekovu took out his new samurai and a few of his throwing stars this time, and they all perished at the hands of Wanyan Yekovu. Wanyan Yekovu, covered in blood, stood there amid the bodies he had just killed. Stepping over them, he slung his samurai, and the blood flew off the blade. He twisted the cane, and the blade withdrew back into its chamber. As he grabbed a few of his throwing stars, I have never met men with so much hatred and anger towards someone that they don't even know. One in Yekovis said as he latched his cane to his back and walked toward a dumbfounded. Anatoly. But today, you may know that I serve Sabaoth, and this boy that you called me, shall. Take your life, not because I'm mad, but that you are evil and Sabaoth hates evil men. Anatoly took out a pistol and raised it to shoot one in Yekovu but Wanyan Yekovu fell to the ground, flipped, and grabbed a shield of one of the men that laid on the ground. Hiding behind the shield until the shooting stopped, Wanyan Yekovu grabbed a star and threw it into the man's hand, making him drop the weapon. Anatoly shouted in pain, You motherfucker! Wanyan Yekovu throws another star into his throat. Grabbing his throat, Anatoly started choking on his blood. Wanyan Yekova picked up Anatoly's pistol and shot him twice in the head. Afterward, he dropped the gun and walked over to Ude and shook him until he awoke. Go, go now, to Lake Providence there. You will look for a man named Tabitha. Tell him his son Wanyan Yekova sends you there for refuge and peace, and all shall be well with you. I have seen your heart, and you will be around people with the same heart and soul. Don't ever be afraid or ashamed to tell your story or your secrets. Secrets can make and will make you lonely, and even the Torah said to defeat the enemies is by the words of your testimony. Uday rubbed his head from the pain as Wanyan Yekovu tore a piece of cloth from one of the corpses and wrapped his head to stop the bleeding. With tears in his eyes, Uday said, Thank you. Wanyan Yekovu and Uday talked until they were back on Highway 65 before heading their separate ways. Wanyan Yekova headed south on Highway 65, and Uday headed north along the river and banks, making sure none of his people saw him. With his clothes drenched in blood and pieces of flesh here and there, Yael appeared before Wanyan Yekovu. Well done, indeed, an excellent job. Wanyan Yekova smiled. With a face like that, I can't tell. Yael looked strangely and asked, Do you feel the difference between fighting in the spirit versus fighting in the flesh? Yao with a half smile. Is that better? Wanyan Yekova said. Please don't ever be a comedian. Yao made another forced smile, and Wanyan Yekova laughed. Yes, I understand now by me fighting in the spirit, I'm less tired, and it appeared as if many of them were going in slow motion. Calculated steps and concentration were my friends in that battle. Yao looked at. Wanyan Yekovu. There's a pond nearby. You may want to change. Walking and talking about. The fight, Wanyan Yekovu and Yael walked down Henderson Loop and ended up in a small pond. While Wanyan Yekovu washed his clothes and bathed in the pond, Yael said to Wanyan Yekovu, Physical battle can be won in the spirit, if one knows how to do it. But you need to deny your physical self in a battle with a spiritual being. Wanyan Yekovu looked at Yael. What? The look on Wanyan Yekova's face was priceless, as Wanyan Yekova said, I'm sorry, I have never heard you speak in such a way. Yael said, You have never had to battle what you are about to battle either. Wrapping up his belongings and putting on fresh clothes, Wanyan Yekova said, What is it I'm about to battle? Yael said, You'll see. Wanyan Yekova smiled. 
Now that's the way I'm used to you talking. Yao, with a half smile. Take your rest today and make your way to Sondheimer by morning. Pointing, Yao said. If you go straight that way, it will take you thirty minutes to get to Sondheimer. If you take the road, it will take you an hour and a half. One in Yekovich shook his head. Well, you know which way I'm going. Yao looked at. One in Yekavu. The things that are happening to you, think not that it's by accident. They were. Planned. And the things you are going through think not that it will not help you later on in life. Like Jonah, you must make a three-day journey in one day. However, before you leave Louisiana, the spirit of Joshua shall cover you. As Yael was speaking, he faded away and disappeared. One in Yekavu quickly made a campfire, staring into the flames for a moment. He grabbed his notepad and wrote, From Jonah to Joshua? Jonah thought that the people he was sent to talk to would not listen to his voice. Thinking it was a waste of time, he denied, he declined. He didn't even try. Even though God told him to, he did not go. Because of his experience, not the power of the Lord. But because of his choice, he was swallowed up in the belly of a whale. For not listening to the Almighty's voice. Joshua, on the other hand, was a faithful man. Believing in the Lord, his power, his might and dared any human to defy the Lord, took command after Moses and led his people to the promised land. How can anyone go from the spirit of Jonah to Joshua? Only through experience. I don't think I'm that man. I'm scared. Thinking, no one would listen to me, because of how my life used to be. Now I don't really care what others think of me. I was told I was there, from the man that lives in the air. But I do say to myself, and no one else. I drink my beer, I smoke my weed. Who will listen to me? Knowing what love is, knowing what hate is, seeing them both. From coast to coast. The power of God is stronger. This is the only thing that has allowed me to last this long. Let someone tell me to talk to someone, it scares me. However, if I see someone in need, my heart is open, my voice is long, until their heart is singing a song. Express my anger, express my pain, express the power of God. Then I end with Selah. I still wonder how did I go from Jonah to Joshua.